Um, members, we, I will take this opportunity to interrupt debate for question time. Are there any questions? President. President. Thank you. Uh, the <coughs> Leader of the Opposition. So thank you, President. My question without notice of which some has been given is to the Minister for Mental Health representing the Treasurer, 474. Uh, I refer to the media release of August 8, 2021, outlining the government's announcement of $1.9 billion to be added to the health budget in the upcoming state budget. And I ask one, how many of the new 332 new beds to be opened in WA will be housed in existing buildings and how many will be in as yet unbuilt wards? Two, how many of the new 332 beds will come from currently existing but unstaffed beds or wards? Three, how many of the 100 new doctors and 500 new nurses positions will be permanent full-time positions? Four, what is the annual budget impact of the additional wages of those additional staff and the new beds? Five, will this additional wage cost continue past the next election when the government's on or revenue is expected to correct to the normal long run levels? And six, if yes to five, what savings will the government make to cover the additional annual costs? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President. And I thank the leaders of, Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Treasurer. Uh, one to six, the honourable member should put this question on, on notice to the Minister for Health. Huh. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, my question, without notice with, of which some has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. Uh, I refer to the Auditor General's Information System Audit Report 21, State Government Entities, released last month, which reported 553 general computer control issues attributed to the 59 audited entities, which followed the 522 IT issues identified last year. I ask, a, of the 42 per cent of this year's findings that have been previously reported by the Auditor-General and not acted on, how many have been addressed since this report's release? B, with only 50 per cent of the audited entities, audited entities meeting the benchmark for information security, a drop of 7 per cent from last year, what processes have been put in place to protect the confidentiality and integrity of information stored in those systems? C, how many cyber attacks were reported in 2017 to 18, 19, 20 and 21? And D, how many of the attacks listed in C resulted in information being accessed by unauthorised parties? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. I do just note myself, um, this question relates to a report on uh, entities across uh, the state government. Um, a, D, a to D, as this question relates to multiple government agencies, it is not possible in the time permitted to provide a complete and accurate answer. I would recommend the member put this question on notice to the relevant ministers, minister for their response. The Honourable Colin de Grasse. Thanks, uh, President. My question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Housing. I refer to the Government Regional Officer Housing, GROW, and I ask one, what was the total number of GROW stock as of June 2021? Two, what is the total wait list for GROW across all departments as of June 2021? Three, for two, please break down into wait lists for each government department. Four, in the absence of available GROW stock in a particular location, A, what is the course of action to ensure that uh, grow, uh, government regional officers have access to a house? B, what was the total cost to the government for providing alternative accommodation options? And five, if the Department of Communities does not collect this data or cannot provide a response to any of the above, why not? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of a question. One, as of the 30th of June 2021, there were a total of 5,040 grow properties. <clears throat> two, as at 30th of June 2021, there were 217 additional requests for grow housing from client agencies. Three, the information is um, in tabular form, and I seek leave to have that incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thanks, uh, President. 4A, requests for housing under the GROW program are met by allocation of vacant existing GROW stock, sourcing leases from the private market, expressions of interest from investors or local government, and constructing and spot purchasing properties from the GROW Capital Works budget. <coughs> uh, B, the GROW program is responsible for providing housing. Individual client agencies make arrangements for any alternative accommodation required for their employees. Five, not applicable. The Hon. Jon Sibma. Uh, thank you, President. My question without um, notice, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Environment. And I refer to an ABC online article of 24 June by Hannah Barry uh, called Dampier Peninsula Buccaneer Archipelago Marine Park Plan Attracts 17,000 Submissions. And I ask one, how many submissions on the draft Marine Park Plan were received from individuals or groups domiciled outside of Australia? Two, will those submissions be set aside or will they be considered in the formulation of the final draft marine park plan before it receives ministerial approval? 
Three, how many submissions on the draft marine park plan were received from Australian-based individuals or groups domiciled outside of Western Australia? And four, will those submissions be set aside or will they be considered in the formulation of the final draft plan before it receives ministerial approval? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some nods to the question. One, 871 submissions on the indicative joint management park. Uh, sorry, joint marine park management plans were received from individuals or groups domiciled out of Australia. Two, all submissions are considered. The location or origin of responses is taken into account to ensure that local issues are addressed in the finalisation of the management plan. Three, 12,520 submissions on the indicative joint marine park management plans were received from Australian-based individuals or groups domiciled outside of Western Australia. And four, see answer to two. The Honourable Nick Guerin. Thank you, President. My question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Minister for Education. I refer to the article in the West Australian on 3 August 2021, <laughs> Sex Assault Claims Rock High School, and I ask one, is the alleged offender still attending the same high school as the female students he is alleged to have assaulted? Two, on what date did the Minister meet with the school in question following this incident? Three, on what date did the Minister meet with any of the families of the students involved in this incident? Four, what support is being offered to the students who have been assaulted, and five, what measures has the school put in place to protect other students from these type of assaults? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One, no. Two, the Deputy Director General Schools met with the school on the 4th of August 2021. It would not be appropriate under the communications agreement for the minister to meet directly with the school on an ongoing operational matter. Three, a meeting has been arranged with parents of two of the female students. Four, support plans have been created for the female students that encompass uh, protective security measures, support from the school psychology service and strategies for teachers and other staff to provide additional support to the students and their parents. Five, in addition to physical separation and increased supervision, the school has prioritised the delivery of protective behaviours curriculum so that every student knows what is acceptable, what to do to be safe and who they can go to for support. The Hon. Donna Farragher. Uh, thank you, President. President, my question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the Supporting Communities Forum and I ask one, will the Minister list a the current membership of the forum and b the number of meetings, including the date of each meeting, that the forum has held since 1 January 2020? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Community Services. Thank you, President. I thank the member for some notice of the question and provide the following answer on behalf of the Minister for Community Services. 1. A. As of 31 May 2021, Community Sector and Government Co-Chairpersons Michelle Scott, Director, McCusker Centre for Citizenship, Jody Kant, Acting Director General, Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage, Deputy Chairperson Kate George, Consultant, Community Sector Members Louise Giolito, CEO of Wacos, Dan Minchin, CEO of Chorus, Tricia Murray, CEO of Wansley, Maria Osman, Ministerial Multicultural Advisory Council member, Julie Whalen, State Manager, National Disability Services WA, Ross Wortham, CEO of Youth Affairs Council, Deborah Zanella, CEO of RUA, Felicit Black, CEO of Women's Health and Family Services, Kate Cheney, Director, Innovation and Strategy Anglicare, Justine Collier, CEO of RISE Network, Emma Jarvis, CEO of Palmerston, Melissa Perry, CEO of Communicare, Denver DeCruz, General Manager, Inclusion Solutions, and Kelda Opperman, CEO of Zonta House Refuge Association. Government Sector Members, Mike Rowe, Director General, Department of Communities. Lisa Rogers, Director General, Department of Education. David Russell Wees, Director General, Department of Health. Adam, Adam Thompson, Director General, Department of Justice. Lane Chopping, Acting Director General, Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries. Emily Roper, Acting Director General, Department of the Premier and Cabinet. Susan Hunt, CEO, Lottery West. Jennifer McGrath, Commissioner, Mental Health Commission. Sharon O'Neill, Commissioner, Public Sector Commission. B, there have been 10 meetings, 24th of the 2nd, 2020, 17th of the 6th, 2020, 24th of the 8th, 2020, 5th of the 10th, 2020, 12th of the 10th, 2020, 13th of the 10th, 2020, 19th of the 10th, 2020, 23rd of the 11th, 2020, 28th of the 1st, 2021, and 24th of the 5th, 2021. The Honourable Peter Collier. Uh, thank you, President. My question is that matter to the Minister, the Minister representing the Minister for Police. I refer the Minister to his response to question 383 asked on Tuesday, 3rd of August 2021, and to the announcement on Sunday, the 8th of August, we get $4 billion to reboot Western Australia's health system. And I ask one, 
Will the minister commit to funding the ongoing services of the Soldiers and Sirens program, which provides essential services and support for WA Police, other first providers and veterans, and if not, why not? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, <coughs> President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes to the question. Honourable Member, I saw an error in this question about 15 minutes ago, so I haven't got an updated answer for you. If it comes in at the end of question time, we'll provide it, if not tomorrow. The Honourable Brad Pettit. Thank you, President. <coughs> My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, to the Minister for Mental Health representing the Minister for Climate Action, C491. I refer to the 2019 WA Labor platform stating that in government, WA Labor will develop a measurable practical pathway to carbon pollution reduction designed to get to zero emissions by 2050. And I ask, given, the, given this measurable practical pathway is not contained in the WA climate policy, will the Minister please table it? If the pathway has not yet been developed, will the Minister please provide an update on the progress of this commitment? And three, is this pathway consistent with the findings and recommendations of the recently released IPCC report? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes to the question. The following answers provided on behalf of the Minister for Climate Action. Questions one to three. The Western Australian Climate Change Policy outlines several measures which will develop pathways to net zero emissions. These include, but are not limited to, whole of system planning for the Southwest interconnected system. Uh, will include scenarios for renewable energy and storage penetration consistent with national and state emissions reduction goals. State government agencies, including GTEs, will develop and implement plans to transition toward net zero emissions by 2050. And sectoral emissions reduction strategies will evaluate opportunities for cost effective abatement across Western Australia's key economic sectors and develop strategies to guide emissions reduction. Each of the above streams of work are currently in progress, and further updates will be provided in due course. The Hon. Wilson Tucker. Thank you, President. My question without notice, in which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health. Can the Minister provide the COVID-19 vaccination rates of Indigenous West Australians broken down by age group and geographical region? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, the COVID-19 vaccination rates for Indigenous Western Australians information comes from the Australian Immunisation Registration AIR, which is Commonwealth data. WA Health is not authorised to provide this data. The Honourable Sophia Mormont. Thank you, President. My question, without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer the Minister to the harm minimisation strategies, priority substances and priority populations outlined in the Australian Government's National Drug Strategy 2017 to 2026, and I ask how many people are currently incarcerated for cannabis crimes in Western Australia, and two, how many of Western Australians currently incarcerated for cannabis-related crimes are associated with quantities pertaining to personal use compared to trafficable offences. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney-General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following response on behalf of the Attorney-General. The member's question cannot be answered in the time provided, and I request that the member place their question on notice. <coughs> the Honourable President. Martin Aldridge. Thanks, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. I refer to Legislative Council questions without notice 411 and 431 in relation to the state controlled border and G2G pass applications and ask one, what guidance material or policy has been established to guide decision makers in assessing G2G pass applications, particularly those given discretionary approval by the state emergency coordinator or, or a person authorised by him? Two, please table any documentation identified in one, three, how many G2G pass application decisions have been subject to internal review? And of those, how many were upheld and how many were amended? And four, have any G2G pass application decisions been subject to external review by the Ombudsman, a court, tribunal or similar body? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of, the, of this question. Uh, the following information has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. 
Western Australian Police advise one, all new directions issued by the State Emergency Coordinator are disseminated to staff once published. Operational guidance documents are developed to ensure consistency of decision making. A 24-7 COVID inspector is on duty to provide advice and guidance as required. Two, advice is being sought as to whether these operational documents can be tabled. Three, while matters are routinely reviewed by senior officers, the WA Police Force does not maintain the requested st statistics. And four, no. The Honourable James Hayward. Uh, thank you. My question, without notice, to which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister for Electoral Affairs. I refer to the electoral uh, reform process embarked upon by the State Government, which was not on the agenda immediately prior to the last election, and I ask, one, have the costs of the Ministerial Expert Committee been finalised? Uh, two, if yes to one, please detail uh, the, the total cost to date, the cost of advertising, the cost of re remuneration of committee members, the cost of printing and comp and uh, putting it all together, uh, and uh, any other costs. Three, are there any other outstanding costs for the committee um, that have not been finalised? If yes, how much is still outstanding to date? Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following response on the the following response on behalf of the Minister for Electoral Affairs. One to three, the remuneration of committee members on the Ministerial Expert Committee on Electoral Reform is provided by the Department of Premier and Cabinet. Associated resourcing costs will be included on the biannual report on consultants engaged by government, which will be tabled in the parliament in accordance with Premier Circulation, Circular 2019-06. Executive support for the Ministerial Expert Committee was provided through the existing resources of the Office of the Minister for Electoral Affairs. The Honourable Steve Martin. Thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the shortage of suitable housing for homeless people in regional Western Australia, and I ask one, what new facilities have been contracted to provide accommodation for those experiencing homelessness in regional West Australia in the last 12 months? Two, for each facility in one, A, when did they start accommodating people experiencing homelessness? B, how many people experiencing homelessness will be accommodated? And C, what is the length of the contract? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Community Services. Thank you, President. And I thank the member for some notice of the question and provide the following answer on behalf of the Minister for Community Services. One to two, the Department of Communities have contracted with the Housing First Homelessness Support Services in the last 12 months, including the following Housing First Homelessness Support Services contracted in regional Western Australia. The Roman Catholic Bishop of Geraldton Centre Care Family Services contracted to provide the Housing First Homelessness Support Services, Geraldton, for the period 1 April 2021 to the 31st of March 2026. Anglicare WA Inc contracted to provide the Housing First Homelessness Support Service, Bunbury, for the period 1 February 2021 to 31 January 2026. The Department of Communities has recontracted the Aboriginal Short Stay Accommodation Services in the last 12 months, including the following in regional Western Australia. Australian Red Cross recontracted to provide the Kalgoorlie Calgo Aboriginal Short Stay Service until 30 June 2024. The service provides accommodation for singles, couples and families in 11 rooms. Mercy Community Services Limited recontracted to provide the Derby Aboriginal Short Stay Service until 30 June 2024. The service provides accommodation for singles, couples and families in 30 rooms. Mercy Community Services Limited recontracted to provide the Broome Aboriginal Short Stay Service until June 30, uh, 2024. The service provides accommodation for singles, couples and families in 44 rooms. A full list of contracted homeless, homeless services in regional WA Western Australia is here and I um, seek leave to incorporate the table into hands up. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Uh, the, Honour the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. A question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development, representing the Minister for Water. Refer to question without notice 251, asked on the 15th of June 2021, on the Lennox Weir and the Carbonate River in the city of Busselton, particularly parts 2C and D, in which the answer told the House that surface water will be available to adjacent landowners, but likely at reduced levels. The Water Corporation is working with adjacent landowners to explore other opportunities and ask one, has the Water Corporation discussions, had discussions with the adjacent landowners? Two, if yes to one, when? Three, if no to one, when will those discussions occur? Four, what option, options for access to water has the Water Corporation discussed with adjacent landowners and what amount of water has been identified as available? And five, 
What is the salt level of the water the Water Corporation expects to provide to or give access to the adjacent landowners? The Minister for Regional Development. Well, I thank the member for the question and the Minister for Water has provided the following information. One, yes. Two, a meeting was held on Wednesday 26 May 2021. Three, not applicable. Four, the surface water that collects upstream of the weir, which is accessible to landowners, will still be available. The volume of water and the level of salinity is dependent on climatic conditions, rainfall and tidal movements and will vary throughout the year. Water Corporation will continue to work with the adjacent landowners to determine their water use requirements for agricultural purposes and to work towards a mutually agreeable outcome. Five, removing the weir stop boards and steel frames may see a short-term temporary increase of saline water in, in the upstream during storm surge events. However, this is an entirely natural process experienced in other river systems throughout the region. It should be noted that the current structure is not impervious and currently allows some saline intrusion. President. The Honourable Colin de Grasser. Uh, thanks, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Housing. I refer to Government Regional yes. Officer Housing Grow, and I ask one. Are there minimum security requirements for grow properties? Two, if yes to one, please table the minimum security requirements. If no to one, why are there no security requirements? Three, how many houses did not meet the minimum security requirements at the last audit of grow housing? And four, as of 30 June 2021, how many grow properties are fitted with A, security screens on all doors, B, front door with deadlock, C, security screens on all windows? Leader of the House. Thanks, uh, President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One to three, yes, grow dwellings comply with the minimum security provisions set out in Regulation 12B of the Residential Tenancy Regulations 1989. Grow properties that are leased from private landlords are audited prior to occupation to ensure minimum security standards are, security provisions are met. If a grow leased property does not meet the minimum security provisions, the decision to accept the leased property sits with the client agency or an alternative property is sought. Cl individual client agencies may also provide additional security provisions to their employees. For this information is not collected in a centralised database and it would require individual analysis of each grow property. This would take significant time and effort and would be unreasonable to divert resources away from core business. The Honourable Yon Sidma. Thank you, President. My question without notice, which some notice is given, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Environment. Uh, it's question 483. Uh, I refer to Western Australia's conservation estate and I ask one, what is the current size of the conservation estate by category A, national parks, B, conservation parks, C, nature reserves, D, marine parks, E, marine nature reserves, F, marine management areas and G, reserves managed under sections 51G and 51H of the CARM Act 1984 and two, for FY 2019-20 and FY 2020-2021, what levels of capital and recurrent funding were provided to DBCA to manage each of the categories A through G inclusive? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Uh, one, the area at 30 June 2021 for each category is A, National Park, 6,449,679 hectares. B, Conservation Parks, 1,154,192 hectares. C, Nature Reserves, 10,088,170 hectares. D, Marine Parks, 4,424,469 hectares. Uh, e, Marine Nature Reserves, 132,000 hectares. F, Marine Management Areas, 143,385 3, hectares. G, Reserves Managed Under Sections 51G and 51H of the CARM Act 1984, 1,081,536 hectares. Two, I have, I've been advised by the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions that to answer this question requires significant time and resources, and I ask that the honourable member place this question on notice. Uh, the honourable Nick Guerin. Thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer to the Attorney General's media statement on 8 July 2021, which announced that the State Solicitor's Office will now be in independent sub-department of the Department of Justice. And I ask one, are you aware it has been more than three years since the rec this recommendation was made in the Langelant report? Two, what has been the cost to the State in implementing this recommendation? Three, will you table the business case relating to this matter? 
The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question, and I provide the following response on behalf of the Attorney General. One to three, the establishment of the State Solicitor's Office as an independent sub-department of the Department of Justice was the subject of a Cabinet decision. It will have a minimal impact on the State's finances. Of the the Hon. Brad Pettit. Thank you, My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Climate Action, C492. I refer to the Minister's forward in the Debray Climate Policy, which states, Western Australia's greenhouse gas emissions are rising and are expected to grow in the short to medium term under business as usual. And I ask, what are West Australians, what are Western Australia's expected greenhouse gas emissions for 2025, and what data is this based on? To, will the minister please table the modelling or data containing this information? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answers provided on behalf of the Minister for Climate Action. One to two. Australia's national emissions projections are compiled by the Commonwealth Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources to provide sector-specific analysis of factors driving emissions at a national level. The Commonwealth does not publish state and territory emissions projections. The Hon. Martin Aldridge. Thanks, President. My question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. I refer to the four jurisdictions identified as medium risk under Western Australia's controlled border arrangements, New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia and Victoria, and ask one, are the conditions of entry for people seeking to enter WA using a G2G pass consistent across these four jurisdictions, or does each jurisdiction have individual conditions? Two, for any jurisdictions with individual conditions, please provide detail. Three, has the Chief Health Officer provided advice to WA Police to enable them to process G2G pass applications for travellers from medium risk jurisdictions? If yes, to three, please table this health advice. The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The following information has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. One to four. The Western Australia Police advise no. The approved traveller categories are consistent across medium risk jurisdictions, and as a result of advice provided by the Chief Health Officer in relation to the worsening situation in New South Wales, the West Western Australia Police Force adopted a stricter approach in accordance with the directions. The Honourable James Hayward. Uh, thank you very much. My question without notice, to which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House, representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to the Bunbury Outer Ring Road and I ask, in relation to the southern section of the Bore, has the Government considered alternative routes other than the current route through Jalora? Uh, if, you, two, if yes, how many alternatives have been identified? Three. For each alternative route identified, what was the main reason for not pursuing that option? For what impact would the current uh, preferred route for the southern section of the bore have on the basalt resource near Anvil Road? Specifically, could quarry op operations continue if the uh, current plans were realised? The Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One to three, a number of alternative routes were considered during the planning process, with the comprehensive reasons for selecting the original route detailed in the Southern Section Alignment Selection Report. Four, the basalt resource and its operation is being managed through the project planning and development. The Hon. Steve Martin. Thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some notice is given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Communities at C446, and it was uh, submitted on the 4th of August. I refer to the $6 million Local Government Partnership Fund for Homelessness announcement recently, and I ask how many homeless beds is the program expected to deliver for each year over the next five years? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Community Services. Thank you, President. I thank the member for some notice of the question and provide the following answer on behalf of the Minister for Communities. The Department of Communities is supporting local government initiatives through Local Government Par Partnership Fund for Homelessness to respond to and prevent homelessness. The fund does not prescribe a specific number of beds. It gives local governments the opportunity to design and to deliver responses tailored to, tailored to respond to needs of the local community. The Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, President. <coughs> Question without notice of which some has been given is for the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Ports, uh, 456. Uh, I refer to the Fremantle Port Authority's application under Part 5 of the EPA, EP Act to amend its licence to export iron ore from 5.1 million tonnes per annum to 2.5 million tonnes per annum from August 2020. And I ask, 
One, what volume of iron ore was exported from Cronana Bulk Terminal for the financial years 2016-17 to 2021 inclusive? Two, why did the Fremantle Port Authority request to decrease its export of iron ore from Guanana Buck Terminal from 5.1 million to 2.5 million tonnes a year, effective from August 25, 2020? Three, will the Minister table the process and decision within Fremantle Port Authority effectively halving its export of iron ore from the Guanana Buck Terminal? And four, if not, why not? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, 2016 4,301,838. 2017 2018-19, 16,098. 2019-20, 16,079. 2020-21, 318,349. 2-4, I tabled the attached, publicly available document. That document is tabled. The Honourable Peter Collier. Thanks, President. My question with that letter, if some is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister of Police. I refer the Minister to Operation Tide and ask, one, how many personnel are currently operating in Tide? Two, will the Minister provide a breakdown of the numbers according to areas of responsibility for those in one? If not, why not? Three, do any of those referred to in one receive an additional allowance while being deployed in Tide? Four, if yes to three, what is the quantum of the additional allowance? And five, are those referred to in one permitted to engage in any secondary employment? If not, why not? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following information has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. The Western Australian Police advise one to two. There are 406 police officers and 39 police staff allocated to Operation Tide. For operational reasons, more specific information relating to staffing levels at individual business units is, is not publicly released. Three, no. Four, not applicable. Five, all Operation Tide staff are vaccinated, and those undertaking airport and hotel quarantine duties are also subject to regular COVID-19 testing. Police take a rigorous risk-based approach when considering individual requests for secondary employment from officers attached to Operation Tide. President, the Leader of the House. I ask the Business of the House be resumed. The Business of the House has resumed. Are there any further answers from uh, Ministers or Parliamentary Secretaries? Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I table documents in relation to question on notice number 150, asked by the Honourable Peter Collier to the Leader of the House, me representing the Minister for Housing. Uh, and President, um, during the debate on the Metropolitan Region Scheme, Bilia Wetlands Bill 2021, I undertook to pass on to the Minister for Transport the request for supplemental information for the Honourable Neil Thompson and the Honourable Nick Goyran. I have done that, and on behalf of the Minister for Transport, I tabled the supplementary information. That uh, information is tabled. Are there any further answers? The Minister for Mental Health. President, pursuant to Standing Order 1082, I inform the House that the answer to question on Notice 146, asked by the Honourable Neil Thompson, on the 3rd of June 2021 to the Minister representing the Minister for Health will be provided on 19 August 2021. Any further answers from Ministers or Parliamentary Secretaries? No, uh, we return to order of the day number 46, the Public Health Amendment Safe Access.